to Russellville First United Methodist Church, where we are on a mission to make disciples who love God and love others. And I'm so glad each and every one of you are here this morning or joining us digitally online. Grab your bulletin, if you will. You can get it online or you have it in your hands if you're here. And I want to point out some things in the back on the news to you section. We are in a wonderful time of year where our kids and our youth are going to get together and have a few parties and celebrations. So you'll want to be sure to see what's going on with that. Lots happening tonight. There is a youth explosion. It is a Christmas theme one. Pastor Cindy and her volunteers do such a great job with explosion. So make sure you have plans to be there tonight if you are in fifth through 12th grade. Second I want to talk to you about is an insert in your bulletin. You can also get this on the Faith at Home page. It is for poinsettias. Um, we are ordering them this year. They will be here next week. So if you would like to purchase one in honor or in memory of someone, you can fill out this slip and get it turned into the church office um, or call them. I'm sure they can do it over the phone as well. And then finally, about next week, they will be here because next week is Lessons and Carols at 6 o'clock on Sunday. Um, let me tell you two important things to know. If you are planning to participate in Lessons and Carols virtually from the comfort of your own home or wherever you might find yourself, let me encourage you this week to come by the church office during business hours and pick up some candles. We have some candles for you so you can participate. And you know how we always lovely close it with candlelight and silent night. And so we want you to be able to do that wherever you might find yourself this year. So come by and pick up some candles for you and your family and friends as you gather at home. If you're planning to be here next Sunday night at 6, I strongly, 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 strongly encourage you to go online today and reserve your spot. We have limited capacity due to our guidelines to keep us all safe and healthy due to the pandemic. And so if you want to be here, you better reserve your spot. Let me just say that, okay? We will follow in our guidelines and keep you safe and healthy, but we need to know that you're coming. So make sure you do that. But either way, you can participate in Lessons and Carols, and I'm really looking forward to it again this year. It'll be a good time. We're going to have a virtual choir for one of our songs. That's going to be cool, right? Um, so make plans um, to do that this year. So with that, why don't we stand again and sing? Pr oh, no, we're not doing that yet, are we, Brian? He, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to have the Matheny's come light the Advent candle. <laughs> We will light this candle to signify our hope. We not only look to our own bright future, but also seek the well-being of our neighbors and even our enemies, bearing witness to a living hope that the one who lifts us up has come to redeem and restore all the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
You are the source of our hope and the one we hope for. May the hope we find in you surround us and lift us, driving out fear and inspiring us to love. And may this lively hope lead us into new birth through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
These past nine or 10 months, I believe the COVID-19 pandemic has brought out the best in many people. There have been escalated instances of compassion, empathy, courage, and the will to lend a hand. These pastors are true examples of this. Their leadership and care during this trying time has been a beacon of positivity and purpose. I've heard before, I've heard before that in the most difficult times, the truth of a person's soul is seen. Well, we see them, and they're doing great. So I, on behalf of the church congregation, would like to thank them. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, verses 1 through 8. Would you please stand as you're able for the reading of God's holy word? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'll add the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, you know, there is a small group of us, but I bet there's a better amen in us. Let's give it a try. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. It is good to see you this morning. My name's Tony Griffin, and I'm senior pastor of Russellville First United Methodist Church, and it's my joy to be in worship with you this morning and have the privilege and opportunity to share God's word with you during this season of anticipation, this season of arrival, this season of Advent. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Sarah and the sermon that she brought last week and the way that it introduced 
this series called Coming Soon. She told you about her family's love for movies, and I think it set things up wonderfully because the, the flow of the Advent season is like a movie, really. She invited us to stay tuned last Sunday, <clears throat> last Sunday because Scripture builds this sense of expectancy as we anticipate the arrival of Christ. It's during this time that we remember the first advent, right? The coming of Christ in the manger. But we prepare and we anticipate his second advent, his coming again. And Pastor Sarah, by inviting us to stay tuned, lets the suspense heighten as we see the season bear witness to God through the lives of these characters in Scripture. And you'll see in coming days, Elizabeth and Mary, of course, and how their lives bear witness to the fact that nothing is impossible with people who yield their lives to God to do His will. And all of this builds up, of course, to the climax of the Christmas story where the Christ child is born, but not in a way that we expect Indeed, all of the plot twists end in a cliffhanger that, that calls us to envision where it is that God is calling us to be a part of this story. And today we encounter a pivotal character, an unforgettable character in the person of John the Baptist, and we want to consider today his baptismal limits. Let's pray. Lord of new life and hope, prepare our hearts to hear from your word and to obey. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bishop Michael Curry in his book called Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, paints this wonderful picture of the love of his grandmother as he remembers her in her kitchen when he was a child growing up, and he would be there watching her prepare meals. He said she put on her favorite apron like a, like a battle-worn uniform that kind of just hung off of one shoulder because she was all about work, and her hair was pulled in this tight bun behind her, and she would would be there rinsing what seemed like mountains of greens. She would rinse those greens and wash away the grit as she started to prepare them. And she would chop and chop and she'd snap peas. And and then, he said, he, he recalls New Year's when they would have a special treat at New Year's. And that's when she would start the rinsing and boiling of chitlins. But you didn't hang around long for the rinsing and boiling of chitlins to prepare them for cooking, did you? No, no. How many of you know what chitlins are? I see some heads out there. Yes, okay. Some hands indicate that, yes, we are Southerners and we have heard of chitlins. Those of you who have not heard of chitlins, well, they're not the most satisfying part of the hog, but they are, well, they're the large intestine of the hog. So it does require rinsing and boiling to prepare them, and then hopefully you get them fried up with some hot sauce to make you forget that you're, well, anyway. But interestingly, Curry didn't grow up in the South. He grew up in New York. He grew up in Buffalo, New York. But not unlike other African Americans, he says they were rooted in the South. He says you could say they were in exile, They were in exile from the Jim Crow laws and the oppression that still existed in the South and the terror that that still happened after the end of Reconstruction. And like other peoples who migrate or immigrate or live in diaspora from their native home, urban blacks with Southern roots brought home with them. He says, for them that meant that though we lived in the North, we ate South. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? I like that. Though we live in the north, we ate south, which for him meant grits, collards, fried everything you can imagine, hot sauces, well-spiced foods, desserts galore, sweet tea, and on and on it goes. Now, keep your seats. It's not time for lunch yet, but I get it. That makes you hungry, right? 
Curry's grandmother represented all of that to him, all of that wonderful tradition. She was the daughter of sharecroppers, granddaughter of former slaves in North Carolina. Curry would watch her as she stood there cleaning those greens, pounds and pounds of them, getting ready to work, for, work one of her culinary miracles. But what Curry didn't realize back then what is, what, was that his grandmother was serving up a lot more than food. She would heap those collards and the rice and the gravy and all that wonderful fried stuff onto your plate, but what she was really serving up was love. She was, she was expressing the best of the tradition that, that Curry didn't know at the time, but, but we know now as soul food, right? It was a fusion of West African foods and flavors and then Southern habits thrown in for African-American people. It was acts of incredible practical creativity. Because you see, black cooks had to do all they could to stretch food out by using cheap cuts of meat like chitlins and lots of inexpensive vegetables and starches, foods that the class-conscious whites rejected. And this goes back to when slaves were a part of the plantation and they would take a, a pig on, on the farm there and they would butcher it, but they'd keep all the good cuts of meat and then the, left, the rest would be left for the slaves. Curry said that's what his grandmother called making do. We've all had to make do at one time or another, haven't we? We know what it, what it means to make do, but, but Curry said this about his grandmother that was so amazing about her, because he said, if making do was what my grandmother did, then, then making do meant turning grits into something that was gourmet. It meant turning foods that, that she spread out and stretched so delicious that you would forget your troubles when you were sitting at the table. In spite of limitations... The food was transformed by love. The scene set for transformation in today's scripture. We see this in, encounter with the character John the Baptist, who's an unforgettable character to say the least. I mean, he's looking as wild as the wilderness, his wilderness surroundings where he is. And, and John's baptizing and receiving confession and preaching of the one stronger than I, he says. John's doing a lot of the work that we would expect with the coming of a Savior, but he knows that he's limited, and his work is limited, and it points to the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit, a baptism of transformation. Even so, he gives himself completely to the cause. You don't see him saying to himself, well, all I have is this, or all I have is that. Rather, he takes what he has, and he gives himself to the cause. Now, something I don't want us to miss here is the kind of waiting that this models for us. It's a kind of waiting that requires not only action, but the kind of action that prepares people to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. It prepares them in, in such a way that they know that good news is on its way. John is calling people to repentance a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of direction in one's life. And it's a work of love. We remember our baptism every time we, we have a baptism in the life of our church. We'll have a child up, we'll have an adult up, we'll have whoever it is, the candidate for baptism or the confirmands will come up. And during that time, it's a call for all of us to remember our baptism. But not only are those times to remember our baptism, ideally we'd remember it every day. I've told you before that I have a little laminated tag that looks like a luggage tag that hangs on the faucet in my shower. And I think many of you have those as well because we've passed those out before. And I hope you still have yours. And it has a prayer on there. It says, Lord, as I enter the water to bathe, I remember my baptism. 
Wash me with your grace. Fill me with your spirit. Renew my soul. I pray that I might live as your child today and honor you in all that I do. You see, remembering our baptism is not necessarily remembering the event itself. Many of us wouldn't be able to do that because we were baptized as infants. Rather, remembering our baptism is remembering that we are truly loved, forgiven, accepted without any reason of deserving or earning it. We're reminded that we are created as children of God in God's very image. And we're reminded that God calls us to serve just as we are, no more, no less, even with all of our limitations, perhaps even because of our limitations. Because what we see in the transforming work of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is often what we perceive to be limitations are exactly what God uses to mold us and shape us and call us with the message of the good news. So when we wait during Advent, we wait actively. We lean in with the expectation that good news is around the corner. In today's scripture, John gives us one more thing to remember about baptism. That baptism is the model for receiving the good news of Jesus Christ. That daily we die to sin and rise to new life in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. As we live out this pattern, our hearts are changed. God works on us each and every day as we make room for him and allow him into our lives. Living baptismally is living in such a way that we're ready to accept the good news. We're leaning into it and preparing for it in Advent. And as we remember that baptism, we're reminded that we join John the Baptist in preparing the way by engaging the world in a heart-changing way. And we're reminded that we're capable of doing this. We're able to do this just as we are, not because of what we can do, but because what Jesus Christ can do in us and through us. As John was, all John had was, what, a leather belt, right? And we hear about the camel coat that he had, and he ate locust and wild honey, but he was set to be a major player in God's story through Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've heard the story of a young woman named Sheena uh, Mahaken. She found herself consumed and drained from her job and a lack of creative inspiration. She was working in an advertising agency. But then it came upon her to, to maybe issue a creative challenge. She felt burdened by the way that that fashion encourages us just to get something new and throw away the other or, or the feeling that we constantly need to have something new. So what she decided she was going to do was wear one black dress the entire year. But what she decided to do was to wear that one black dress and take it as a challenge each and every day to change things up, maybe with different earrings or, or a scarf or, or just wear things differently in a way that was new and unique every day. She wanted to challenge herself. And not only did she do that, but she paired this challenge with a cause because she had an ethnic background that was Indian and she wanted to raise money for a school in India that helped children get a good education. So the money that she would have spent on clothes would go to the cause, and she would need to make do with that one black dress. Well, her project quickly gained notice, and she found others wanting to join her along the journey. Not only did people want to donate to her cause, but they also wanted to participate in her black dress experiment. So Sheena started receiving donations and accessories from secondhand stores and clothes that was being recycled, vintage stores and this sort of thing, to spruce up her little black dress. And others started doing the same thing. And they were coming up with their own black dress projects and sharing photos of creative things you could do with it on social media. 
You see, what she did was she allowed limitations to spark creativity that was contagious and life-changing for her and the people involved and the children who could now go to school. Limitations, you see, can have a way of freeing us to discover that it does not take much to be an active participant in this Christmas story. God provides you just come as you are. You jump in and make do. Bishop Michael Curry's grandmother said she was making do, but she gave herself to the process and then God took her from making do to transforming it into an act of love. And Sheena's limitations prepared a way for others to find their own creative solutions to color the world. And John the Baptist's limitations prepared the way for hearts to be changed in anticipation of the one who changes everything. What if we gave ourselves wholly to the cause of Christ? Not just with our limitations, but with, with our whole selves. Those things that we think exclude us, those things that make us reticent, those things that sometimes keep us on the edge of the pool, not giving ourselves completely to the cause. We need to ask ourselves, how is God inviting us into action that prepares our hearts for transformation? What is God calling you to do to prepare for the coming of Christ? My brothers and sisters, sometimes it might seem like we're just making do. But if we give ourselves wholly to the God who in Jesus Christ transforms everything, making do takes the ordinary to the extraordinary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, as we go into a time of prayer, I hope you indeed will allow yourself, you'll, you'll make yourself an offering to God to allow Him to work in you and through you. And I want to call your attention to the bulletin where we have some names on the prayer list in there. We have Carol Jenkins, uh, Judy Garrett, Whitney Aiken, Atkins, and Mark Blevins. And then condolences to the families of Thomas Aiken. Thomas did pass over the weekend. And uh, Barbara and Sarah and Harold, their families as well, are listed there. And you know of other requests in the life of our church. I pray that you would call them to mind and that you would keep these persons in your heart and on your mind throughout the week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this season of Advent, this call to anticipate and prepare ourselves for the coming of a Savior. We thank you for the first Advent where you came in a mighty and unexpected way, a way that wasn't in line with what the culture would expect, but in line with what the kingdom of God says is power and love. And so we thank you for the birth of the Christ child as we prepare ourselves to celebrate that anew. And we thank you for the fact that you will come again and that you are calling us to prepare ourselves to experience the fullness of your goodness and grace. And as we do, Lord, help us to lean in. Help us to not hold back in any way, but to give ourselves completely. Because what we might see as making do, you take and transform into your love and goodness and grace. So Lord, hear us this morning as we pray to you prayers of confession, prayers of hope, prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. And Lord, we mention these who are on our prayer list and we call to mind those that you have put on our heart and we ask that you would help us to be Christ to them. We thank you for Russellville First United Methodist Church. We thank you for the people of God here who work so diligently to be a part of the mission 
of making disciples who love God and love others. Continue your good work in us and through us, for we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Sarah. Pastor Cindy's going to set the Lord's table for us this morning. Thank you. Christ our Lord, invite all to his table who love him, who earnestly seek to repent of their sins and live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God and to each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cries of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves his love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we prepare to give gifts of tithes and offering back to God, I have a photo for you to look at of more than manna, and that is one of the ways that your gifts and tithes and offering help in this community and in this church. And more than manna had to adapt like everybody else did during the season of COVID, and so you can see kind of how it's changed a little bit. There is still a hot meal available. There's still music available for people to enjoy. Communion is offered as well. And so I'm very thankful this ministry has been able to continue, and it's only because of your gifts of money, but also your time. Some of you come and cook and serve, and thank you for ministering to our community in that way. You'll also see on the screen many ways to give. Of course, if you're here today, you have an offering plate as you leave the building. But if you're worshiping with us online or if it's more convenient for you here, you can always mail a check. You can text a gift. You can give online. You can give in an app. There's so many ways to give. Um, there's bank drafts. That's an easy way to give as well. Well, let us pray over these gifts that will be given and ask God's blessing. Pray with me. God, John the Baptist reminded us uh, long ago to prepare the way of the Lord, and today we are still reminded to prepare the way for your son, Jesus Christ. During these weeks that lead up to Christmas, we get so focused on giving and getting things, and I ask that you would calm us from that frenzy that gets created in our culture, help focus our minds and our hearts with anticipation on that awesome gift of your son, Jesus' birth, and we join now in this act of giving as just one way to humbly prepare for your coming. In the name of your Son, amen. I invite you to stand for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. is 
You may be seated. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be the body of Christ for the world redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God. Amen. 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 Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Though we are many, because this is one loaf, we are one body. We're the body of Christ. This is his body broken for you, and this is his blood shed for you. Today, you have been given as you came in a a packet that helps to keep us safe during this time of pandemic that contains both the, the bread and the juice. And if you will just peel back that little top part, You'll be able to receive the wafer, and then we will partake of the juice. So I ask you to take that wafer now and let us receive the body of Christ. And let us receive the blood of Christ. This is the meal that reminds us of all that God has done for us and is doing for us and the fullness of his glory to come. So as we anticipate him in this wonderful season of Advent, I hope that you are strengthened and empowered to do his will. Let us pray together the prayer after communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together our closing song. Please stand. I will. 
Thank the band this morning for helping us to worship. We are thankful for you. Thank you so much. If there are those of you who have not yet become a part of the membership covenant of the church, that is something that we as United Methodists take very seriously. It's a way of remaining accountable to one another and working out God's call on us in community in the church. So I would love to speak with you about that. Any of your pastors would love to talk to you about how it is that we support the church and enact the kingdom in the world through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And if you felt God moving in a way today that has caused you to ask questions or want to talk or pray with someone about growing deeper in your discipleship, we would love to pray with you. Please feel free to call us throughout the week or see us after the service and we would be happy to do that. Recognize this, people of God, that making do for Jesus Christ is not just making do. We give our whole selves, no matter what the limitations are, because God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit will accomplish His will in 
spectacular ways that are far beyond our imagination. So I pray that you would give your whole self because it's not just making do. God will take it and transform it. And for that, we say glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen. Friends, we are so glad that you have been here to worship with us this morning. If you are here in person, I want to remind you during our benediction, please just hold hands with those who are in your household. And then if you would be seated as our ushers will come and dismiss you row by row. You can help us out in another way this morning by taking your little communion cup with you and disposing of those in the trash cans that are just outside each exit. Again, we are so glad that you have been here to worship with us. And I was reminded as Pastor Tony spoke of the innkeeper who didn't have a room in his inn to give, but he gave what he had. He gave the stable and God transformed that into the birthplace of our Lord and Savior. So let's go being aware of our limitations, but recognizing those as opportunities for God to do amazing things. Go with hope and peace to love and serve the Lord. Bind us together.